Tell me. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Victoria Thorpe on the Peace Journey here, September 17th, 2013. We are at Bethany United Church of Christ in Seattle. And we walked here 10 miles today, um, got a little lost, but um, we made it. And now we're enjoying company of great folks. And we're going to do a quick interview here. And this is our guest, uh, already a friend of mine, so I can't say I haven't met before, but um, I will let him introduce himself. Hi, Victoria. Um, my name is Charles Jason Baldwin. And um, we met, where was it? Is it Tacoma or Spokane? I get the Spokane. two mixed in. Spokane, yeah. And we were pretty much doing what we're doing now, except you didn't have a long walk. Um, you were, you know, letting everyone know that you're for your fight for your sister's life, you know, and letting everyone know about her innocence and everything. And my heart just goes out to you for it. And I'm just so in awe and, and admire you so much for all the hard work you're that's putting into this. That's not what you're this. supposed to be doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. It's just wonderful. It's just that... Um, <laughs> It is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, but um, what we brought you out to Spokane was your story. Mm -hmm. um, you are one of a famous group called? Uh, we, we've we been called the West Memphis Three. Um, Damien Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly, and myself, we were convicted in 1993. Well, we were convicted in 1994. We were arrested in 1993 for triple murder death that we didn't do and spent 18 years trying to regain our freedom and now trying to regain, you know, the honor of our names and, and, you know, trying to get the case open back up to where, you know, we can find who actually committed the murders. But along the way, you know, I've, I've you know, come to, you know, understand and learn a lot about law and about the death penalty and innocence and things like that. And having faced the death penalty and been innocent and having seen my best friend, my childhood best friend, go to death row for a crime he didn't commit, well, that to me was enough to say, you know, death penalty should be no more in America and around the world. So um, on our trip that we're doing now and our peace journey, we're asking everyone why, why have the death penalty? So your input on that would be? We should not have it because, you know, anybody could find themselves in that situation, you know, to where you're telling your side of the story and you're, you're, you know, trying to let everyone know that you're innocent, but against all logic and reason, it doesn't work out and you find yourself on death row, you know, and the time just ticking by. And even if you look at it, you know, from different, you know, points of view besides the innocence point of view, you know, with just the financial, uh, with just the health of society, it, it's not good any way around the world, uh, around the board. I know um, people can watch Paradise Lost and see documented um, the trial, much of the footage, and can see for themselves that there was no factual connection to you um, and Jesse and Damien to the murders that happened, those poor families, those poor boys. But still you were convicted. It was more of an emotional uh, frenzy and fear maybe? Yeah, um, it was definitely emotional. Anytime you have, you know, kids become murdered it's definitely emotional and people you know want to you know find out who done the crime and and seek justice for that so it, it when when emotions are you know running high and rampant it, it's hard to see through reason and, and you know find the facts of the case and find out who actually committed the crime it, especially when when time is ticking and and you know and and the facts aren't coming in or you know the leads aren't coming in and the police are you know frantic to find, you know, someone who, find the killer, you know, a lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll settle for anyone and, and just, and history has shown this, and just pick someone up who can't defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's who we find a lot of times on our death row, mm -hmm. you know, the, the mentally, you know, challenged, you know, like, you know, Jesse Lloyd Muskelly, God mm -hmm. bless his heart, but, you know, he, he doesn't function very well. And I remember during my trial, or that might have been during my Rule 37 hearing, I remember um, Judge Burnett saying, well, he's street smart. I'm like, that is that can't be the answer because he's street smart. That that doesn't make sense. There's no such thing as street smart because, you know, we, we got to hold ourselves to a higher standard, and especially our judges and things. So for him to say, well, it's okay for him to be retarded because he's street smart and we're going to do all this bad stuff to him, that's not okay. When we were talking earlier, we did some um, private uh, short interviews uh, and we talked about um, 
one of the lead reasons for wrongful convictions is false confession, and that was uh, part of the issue in your case. Jesse Miskelly was kind of bullied into, and his low IQ um, manipulated into confessing at first and um, saying you and Damien were involved, and then that ultimately came out to be not true. He just wanted out of trouble, and we were using that as an example. It's one of the leading reasons for wrongful convictions is false confessions. False confessions, definitely. Um, and another one is um, false um, testimony or false eyewitness testimony. False eyewitness, huge. Um, we, we definitely had both of those going on in our case. Um, we had people who took the stand for whatever reasons, you know, and, and gave false testimony, lied on the stand. And when, when the jurors are sitting there and they're hearing this stuff come across from the stand, the first thing they might ask themselves is, why would that person be lying? Mm -hmm. And they don't know why this, this person is lying. They don't even know that they are lying. So when the police use people who they know are going to give false testimony, it, it, it's a problem, and it leads to more false convictions, and you know, people who are innocent ended up on death mm -hmm. row. Well, and that leads me to um, a thought that us citizens need to be held responsible also because we are putting that pressure on the law enforcement and the prosecutors. They need to be held accountable too. But yes. that pressure of let's just solve this, you know, let's get it done and get it done quickly is unreasonable. What we need to do as citizens, we need to be responsible too and say we're looking for the truth, not no just somebody how, to hang. No matter how long it takes. Um, I talk to my attorney, um, John Phillips Bourne, all the time, and um, you know we're still working to exonerate Damien, Jesse, and myself. But he says, you know, there are a multitude of cold cases out there, and this may very well be one of those cases. We may never find who actually committed the crime, but for the the justice system to hold someone's, you know, life ransom, to hold someone's, you know, honor and, and their name ransom, or to take someone's life ransom just because we haven't found that person is mm -hmm. is wrong, and we need to get away from that. But like you said, we need to uh, give give the you know police and investigators and things the room they need to work in to you know find out where the case leads instead of just throwing someone under the bus or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and to hold the prosecutors accountable for misconduct, purposeful misconduct, would be an easy change, too, to prevent future wrongful convictions. Oh, yeah. Um, what's the guy's name? Michael Morton in, in mm -hmm. Texas. Um, was he successful on that? I haven't heard the results either. I haven't heard it either. But, um, yeah. But his case is, he, he was, how long was he in prison 25, for? 24 20, years? Yeah. 24 years. And he, he was released just like a month or so after we were, and I got to meet him, and he was an amazing guy. I mean, I couldn't imagine being his son, being his son, right? He, he was this kid, three or four yeah. years old, and to lose his mom and then have everyone tell him that his father did it, so he lost both parents, and then to grow up having to be stigmatized with that. I mean, so when, when things are, when, when wrongful convictions occur, it's not just hurting that person who's wrongfully convicted. It hurts their whole family. It hurts society, mm -hmm. you know. And you can see the hurt in society now to where, you know, the first reaction or first statement people say when, when they hear of someone who is innocent in prison, they'll say, well, isn't that what they all say? That is a symptom. That, that shows how wounded our society is that we would say that. Well, and that people have told me, some people along the journey, that, well, the system corrects itself. It's been built in that it, there's checks and balances and it, it will correct itself. Well, for my sister, that's why I, I carry her with me. 18 and a half years, she has not had her case reviewed yet. And it took you guys 18 years with a lot of help, a lot of people who believed in you, to undo a wrongful death penalty and life sentence is really, really not easy, is it? It takes a tremendous amount of energy and, and willpower from from many people. I can't I can't imagine the number of man hours that were practically just donated to you know our case and, and continues to be donated. Um, a lot of times I felt like Humpty Dumpty, you know, fell off the wall and all the king's men couldn't get him back. I mean, I felt like my life this was my life, and it was like all the king's men, everybody was just you know putting forth all this energy to get it back together, to get me free, to get Damien life saved and, and everything and get Jesse, you know, home where you can see his dad and everything. But, you know, as far as the checks and balances go, 
it, it's a system, and, and it's a system that we, we constantly have to tweak and make better. And just because it's, quote, unquote, the best system in the world doesn't mean it can't be better and that we don't need, that we need to stop making it better. Because, you know, humans are humans everywhere, and we make mistakes, and we make mistakes on the job, and the justice system's, you know, no different. There are mistakes made, and then there are people who purposely, you know, go about, you know, putting people away with, without evidence. So it, it, it's, it's a big problem, and it's one that we need to address, and, and one of the first steps that we can do to guarantee that we don't execute another innocent person is to stop the death penalty. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't send a good message when you say, hey, you know, kids, when you're growing up, don't kill, but if you do, we'll kill you, you know. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, oxymoronic or whatever. Hypocritical. Yeah. Hypocritical. Well, we um, would like to ask you, <laughs> I'm so excited, Jason, that all those people worked with you and got you out, and I got to meet you. Um, you were one of my best favorite people in the world, I tell you. Um, but besides that, <laughs> um, we would like to ask everyone to think about what message we want to send. What kind of society do we want? A peaceful one, a compassionate one? Then that would start with ending the death penalty and using those funds and resources elsewhere to create a better society rather than killing. Think so? That would be a, a wonderful first step. Yes. We thank you so much for listening to us, and we hope you'll um, come back for the rest of the peace journey. We have a few more days going. Pray for us. Talk to us. Please um, send us messages and questions. Bye. Bye. Thank you.